Good morning. This is Dave Hall from Precision Components and welcome. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Bearing News for having me speak to you today on the evolution and future of the bearing industry. And in order to talk about the future, we need to take a look at how bearings became a $68 billion industry and how 10 companies consolidated to produce 70% of the world's bearings. To quote Sid Moore, disregard of the past will never do us any good. Without it, we cannot know truly who we are. If we follow the evolution of the bearing industry and do not disregard the past, we can expect the bearing industry to continue its evolution into emerging countries and follow the historical patterns of major consolidation influenced heavily by steel, quality, technology, politics, environmental, and political issues. Which factors should be considered when planning for the next year, decade, or century? Here's a breakdown of the 2017 $68 billion bearing industry with Asia accounting for 45%, Europe 28%, the Americas 25%. And what will be the trends during our future? In spite of what you may have been told by some of my young colleagues, I've not been around in the bearing industry since Leonardo da Vinci sketched the first ball bearing in the late 16th century, only the past 43 years. The first significant technology advancement in 1883 marked the birth of the modern bearing industry when Frederick Fisher, the founder of FAG, invented a process for grinding balls. The other major players of the world bearing industry soon joined the game, but it wasn't until the 1930s and 1940s that mass production took off and advanced rapidly through the 1950s, first starting in Europe, then in North America, and by the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Japan's bearing industry had become a significant factor for the global bearing market. Of the top 10 bearing companies, seven of them are 100 years old or older. Over time, companies merged and consolidated. European, North American, and Japanese companies expanded into other continents through growth and acquisition. FAG is now part of the Scheffler Group that also includes Ina and Luke. Timken has acquired companies including Torrington, which had previously acquired Fafner and Bantam. Now under the SKF umbrella, we have MRC, Kadon, Cooper, Peer, General Bearing, and a host of others. McGill is now part of the Regal Boy conglomerate, which includes Sealmaster and Rollway. Consolidation of those companies into the 10 largest bearing companies has happened largely over the last half century, creating these 10 multi-billion dollar corporations that produce 70% of the world's bearings. Now, even though the US Trade Representative's office did not take our advice when we testified at the 301 hearings, arguing why 301 tariffs on the US bearing industry was a bad idea. We still like to use USTR data. In 1989, the U.S. exported less than half a billion dollars to 122 countries 
with more bearings going to India than China. In three decades, the US exports of bearings has increased 324%. US exports to China rose by 3,500%, moving China from the 20th position to the third largest export market for US bearings. The exports to India rose by 277%, which is lower than the average increase rate. U.S. imports from China rose from $25 million in 1989 to 50, 561 billion in 2017. When I made my first trip to China, they were exporting less than $100 million worth of bearings to the U.S. 25 years later, that number was up five and a half times. And look at the growth rate starting in 2004 after the US ITC decision came down that China was not dumping ball bearings into the US market. And if you think China's 2100% increase is impressive, India went from 0.65 to 152 million a staggering increase of over 23,000%. Bearing production is continually moving to low cost countries, not only for low labor, but also to supply the production demands of the bearings in their fast developing economies and emerging markets. According to the China Bearing Industry Association, China in 2017 produced an estimated $26.5 billion worth of bearings. That is 48 times the dollar value produced 30 years earlier. The total demand for bearings in China represents 26% of the global demand, making China the third largest bearing industry in the world. China currently exports about $4 billion in bearings, which is approximately 6.6% of the global bearing demand. China's bearing industry has long been supported by the government, originally patterned after the Japanese very successful bearing industry. Government programs include R&D support, standards development, favorable tax rates, and VAT tax refunds for exports. All of these have aided the development of China's bearing industry. China's central government has also included bearings in their five-year plans for at least the 25 years that I have been working with China. The highly promoted Made in China 2025 outlines 10 key industries that China will focus on during the next few years through 2025. Eight of those industries require large numbers of high-end bearings to support the targeted growth in these industries. China's bearing industry still faces challenges to bring up the average quality levels, forging methods, manufacturing processes, controls, and other things needed for China to excel in these higher performance bearings, which is still dominated by production from developed countries. As of 2018, China has over 10,000 bearing companies and employs over 400,000 workers. Most of these 10,000 bearing companies are quite small. The 100 largest bearing companies in China combined are about the size of SKF. 
In the recent news, we've seen a lot of things about trade wars, COVID, changing governments, and a lot of uncertainty. And what will that affect the bearing industry? There are international uh, tariffs, the 301 tariffs, the 232 tariffs, and governments that just don't seem to get along. These events are nothing new. I've seen currencies lose and gain 50% of their value. And back in 2005, we woke up one morning and the US dollar RMB exchange rate went from 8.23, where it had been firm for over eight years to 8.1. That exchange rate is now 6.5, a 20% change. Anti-dumping is an ongoing issue. We've been involved in four anti-dumping cases and we have followed many more. We've worked through dock strikes, steel shortages, and an ongoing list of political hurdles and government controls. We've used sources from countries that lost their favored nation status. There have been factories that were nationalized by the local governments. And then there are also global health crises. Political hurdles are a constant strain. Global health crises are unavoidable short-term issues. We are one year into a global pandemic. What will that do to the future of the bearing industry? Plagues and epidemics have ravaged humanity throughout its existence, significantly changing the course of history. From the time Leonardo da Vinci sketched the first ball bearing or around 1600, there have been dozens of global pandemics Known all the way back to 3000 BC, there have been epidemics that wiped out entire communities. The bubonic plague or Black Death had three major outbreaks. The first outbreak is estimated to have killed half of the population of Europe between 1346 and 1353. This caused a shortage of labor, improved and increased the pay for workers and contributed to technology advances. The most recent outbreak in 1855 claimed over 15 million lot victims. Global health crises are unavoidable There have been seven cholera epidemics since 1817. The flu pandemic of 1889 killed over a million people and that was before air travel. The polio epidemic of 1916 started in New York City with 27,000 cases and 6,000 deaths a 22% mortality rate. I had a classmate in school in the 1960s who, was, who contracted polio. Just 100 years ago, the Spanish flu was contracted by 500 million people all over the world. The death rate killed 
20%. An estimated 100 million people died globally. The Asian flu of 1957 claimed more than a million lives. Between 2009 and 2010, over 1.4 billion people contracted the H1N1 swine flu. In recent history, there's also been Ebola and Zika. So far, Despite the hardship, the bearing industry continues to roll on. Not without affecting supply chain. Within the supply chain, there have been issues like personnel shortage, truck drivers, delivery companies have a terrible shortage of personnel. For example, the US Postal Service has over 14,000 delivery people in quarantine, unable to make their deliveries. Shipping congestion. We're seeing shipments sit on docks, bumped from ships three times and ending up leaving the country of origin six weeks late. Chinese factories located in provinces with outbreaks of COVID have been forced to shut down for weeks. Also an influence on the bearing industry will be the population. China's population is expected to peak at 1.44 billion by 2030. On the other hand, India is not expected to peak until 2060 at 1.7 billion. In order for a country to sustain its population, it needs a birth rate of 2.1 births per woman. Germany's birth rate is 1.45, the US 1.76, Japan 1.5, China 1 1.6 in 2018 and expected to be stable for the next century. India has a birth rate of 2.3 in 2018 and won't drop to the sustainable level until 2030. Which of these will have a greater impact on the bearing industry? Population, labor costs, politics? How do you plan and manage risk for the unexpected? Where does your energy come from? What will you do if there's a military coup in that country? Do you have a contingency plan? Two years ago, I had no idea that 301 tariffs would become part of my everyday life. I've spent countless hours with anti-dumping issues. We've worked through four anti-dumping cases involving bearings, dock worker strikes, steel shortages, and a couple of pretty interesting stories I can tell you over a beer or two. Having dedicated my life to the bearing industry, if you were to total the amount of time I've spent traveling to and from China alone, I've spent four months on an airplane. In 2019, I visited 10 countries. In 2020, I visited none. When I started in the bearing industry, I visited customers' factories about four days a week. For the last year, I have visited none. So for the first time in over 40 years in the industry, I come to you at the speed of light over the internet, an obvious but significant result of COVID-19. We can certainly see today 
that the COVID-19 pandemic has a vast major result of people working from home. A significant change. Technology driven solutions and driving the industry forward while the impact of the pandemic is very significant. As far as predicting the future of the berry industry, if we follow the evolution from Europe to North America, to Japan, to China and India, and do not disregard the past, we can develop insights into the future. We can expect further consolidation and continued migration to low cost countries and emerging markets. China is off to a head start. India's growth rate is quite a bit better, but they have a long way to go to catch up to China if it is possible. When will the industry find low cost after China and India? Africa is still an increasing population. Major consolidation and reduction in the number of bearing companies in countries with developing industries. Half or more of the very small bearing companies in China and India will likely go out of business when the owners retire. Many of the cookie cutter versions of the small Chinese companies who were patterned after the government's industrial guidelines will struggle with the new environmental and labor regulations as China becomes more strict. Many of the small companies specializing in high volume, low margin bearing pro products will not survive the competition. Development trends tend to slow down when countries become more environmentally and socially conscious, leaving opportunities for newcomers. Technology is a very important factor so keep an eye on which companies or countries will develop best practices for manufacturing bearings. Keep an eye out for which newcomers will develop world-class bearing steel, forging technology, and rolling element precision. Forging technology in China is significantly behind that of more developed countries with China's production yield on forgings being in the 50 to 60% range. Steel utilization in Japan and the West is typically not below 75% and often as high as 95%. Some manufacturers in developing countries are sending their competitiveness to the scrap recycler. As developed countries focus their resources on higher end bearings, R&D, high efficiency production, they have a limited number of human resources for engineers, process developers, supply analysts and value analysis. This is all affected by the lowering populations and lowering labor force. As far as governmental policies, China is changing from an export economy to a domestic economy. That will influence China's governments support of the bearing industry and will likely make it difficult for small companies within China. In India, the lack of government involvement in the bearing industry makes them much more stable. China's entry into the WTO, trade wars, 
anti-dumping, regional conflicts, all of these play a role in government politics and policies, and they all affect the bearing industry. The top 10 bearing producers in the world have a combined total of over 60 <clears throat> manufacturing facilities in China. China's 13th five-year plan includes recommendations to encourage the investment in China of these top 10 global companies. As the global bearing producers move into China with state-of-the-art technology and using their benefits in China, it will become increasingly difficult for smaller companies to develop and compete. Declining populations and workforces will strain growth and productivity, not to mention the strain they will cause on the social benefits systems of those countries. Where India has a long ongoing population to educate, India also has the potential to expand However, after India, the untapped labor force would be in Africa. You need to ask, what does the future hold and how can we limit our exposure to the environmental, political, and other threats to the future? As far as the long-term effects of population growth, global health issues, and fluctuations in government philosophies, I can say a great, with great certainty that when it comes to risk management, there are a large number of factors that all need to be considered for their uncertainty. However, with the proper strategies to combat these risks, if they do happen, they can easily be resolved and survived. Lately, I've seen a lot of companies that spend a lot of their time on risk management, especially those companies that want to enter into agreements with a single supplier with the idea that as a customer, they will have more leverage. Over the years, I've seen customers consolidate their purchasing to corporate functions then decentralized back to the factories, then back to centralized. This frequently works for the large volume products. However, it is a definite problem for companies that use low volume, many, many part numbers. And somewhere in between, a lot of companies have both of those categories of requirements. There was a time when contracts for high volume parts were divided across three suppliers. If something happened to one of those suppliers, the other two could typically pick up the slack. I know some companies that have put all their eggs in one supplier's basket and that supplier's factory was shut down due to COVID, reopened, shut down again and reopened. I don't know where there can be any more difference noticed in the philosophies of governments than between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. Both administrations have very decidedly tried to do what they feel is best for the United States. And whether you agree that manufacturing should be internalized at the expense of free trade or international trade is a fundamental necessity for countries to coexist. We do our best to pay attention to many of these aspects of uncertainty of the future. And if you have strategy alternatives, both short-term and long-term, that can quickly implement and put you in place to survive these situations, they can be far less painful. <clears throat>
and survival of the unpredictable and unexpected is possible. Uh, we hope that this information has given you some insight and some thought provoking ideas on how to prepare for the future. It has been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you.